done is dream chase my entire life. My mom was like, another dream? Live from New York, it's Saturday how did you get on SNL? I was coming in with that swagger like, I don't care, I don't need this. I don't know nothing about that. It has a boot camp feel to it. You just get one shot to see if it works. Did the last year change the dynamic to not address those things is kind of wild. You never know what's going to come out of my mouth. Have you done Obama in front of Obama? Not yet. Don't tell nobody to come Hey family, it's Carlos Watson. Welcome back to another edition. Now, I've got a guy who's been cracking people up on Saturday nights on NBC, and now he's doing the same thing on Tuesdays, thanks to his role opposite Kenan Thompson on the new comedy series, Kenan. Of course, I'm talking about SNL's very own Chris Red. He's way too funny. Take a look. The Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Hey, Chris. Carlos, what's going on, man? Carlos, watch it. Look at it. Oh, man, you're in the right place today. Now, I hate to say this, but you already have a fan club here at the Carlos Watson Show. Oh, you hate to say that? Because I love when you say Man, I was enjoying you this morning. I was loving your stand-up. That piece you were talking about, walking with your big cousin and oh, yeah. uh, getting punched in the throat. That was great. Yeah. I don't know if you've been hit directly in your throat, but a couple things happened. For one, your throat says and it just closes forever. Your spit is like, get suicidal. It's like, goodbye, I don't need to be in the mouth. <laughs> Dog, I got hit so hard in my throat that I had a limp, and that is not how science works. Yeah, it was a very embarrassing time in my life. If you fought enough growing up, you definitely lost the fight or two. And that was just one of those fights that like, I definitely came in with all the confidence in the world. And, uh, and I left with a lesson. Now, how long have you been in Harlem? I've been in Harlem four and a half years now. After the pandemic, uh, the walls started closing in on me, man. I ain't had no windows. Because I was touring so much that I never like stopped to think about, like, hey, maybe I need more space. And so it was kind of good in that way to kind of slow down. Now, did you stay in New York the whole time? No, I had the highest of anxiety about this whole thing. I mean, I have high anxiety in general. I didn't move, I didn't go outside unless it was like to get essential things. You know, I, I was following science the whole time, you know? Uh, when they started getting the tests, at first it was like Idris Alba was getting tests and that was my humbling experience. That's right, that's right. I knew I wasn't famous enough when I couldn't even get tested, man. So we had, I had to wait and then go to an urgent care. And they took forever to get my results back. I was like, man, I would be dead by the time I get my results back here. <laughs> and so I, I took another test and I got my both results back the same day because the rapid test it just came out. It just dropped the album, right? So I got both results the same day and they were both negative. I was like, ooh, I beat COVID twice. Ooh, I'm free. And the doctor was like, you still got high blood pressure. I'm like, man, black man can't win in America, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they got you one way or another. But you know what, though? It feels like many lifetimes ago. It was only a year ago. I watched everything. I know I know about you. I watched everything. I was alone. I was solo pandemic, in which was different than people that had somebody. It got to a real bitter point, Carlos, where I didn't even want to talk to, like, anybody on the phone complaining about the pandemic who had somebody. It probably made you think about who you should be with. I stepped back, like, I was, I was dating somebody right before the pandemic hit, and I was like, oh, yeah, we wouldn't have made it through. A lot of relationships got super strong from it. And then a lot of relationships are now uh, solo relationships, you know? I watch a lot of porn, you know, I'll be real with y'all. I watch, I watch all of it. That's the commercial Chris Red. I watch all of it. I started sending notes to actresses <laughs> and actors like, yo, your heart's not in it. Oh, man. Oh, man. The kids and me, man, they used to pick on me. I remember uh, this dude I didn't get along with, John. He came up, he was like, hey, Chris, forget you, you stupid. And you got a crackhead uncle. All he does is dig in the trash and do crack. And I was like, so? You know how hard that is? When someone says something that's hurtful and true? Where do you think has the most comedic talent at the moment? Where's the hot spot? I feel like New York is always going to be like top tier comedy. But Chicago's always going to manifest that funny. Uh, LA has talent, but I would put New York above it just because of just the grittiness and just how the scene out here is. I could have a set tonight and I'm following Chris Rock, David Attell, 
of Bill Burr. Healthy food, you can't you can't even smell it. You have a bag of apples right in front of my face. I, I, my eyes are closed, I can't smell it. 200 miles away, oh, is that, is that KFC? Hey, you wanna get some chicken? And then I gotta go up, you know what I mean? And that's a different beast. What is the toughest spot to do it at? You know, in basketball, they talk about the rucker. What's the right. rucker of comedy? Outside. Doing outside shows sucks. You're battling the elements. You're not just battling keeping people's attention. Oh, and music festivals is, are, are kind of terrible um, because uh, everybody on drugs. They're like, I'm here for a band. I'm not here to listen to this. Those situations are pretty tough, but like coming up, uh, Jokes and Notes was my favorite club. It was my home club where I started. Being a thug from Naperville is like being a thug Care Bear. <laughs> like, like you can buy clothes and look the part, but you still start every day sliding down a rainbow slide with your friends. <laughs> Wee! Thug life, we got both parents. <laughs> That room used to be so hard because you would get people from everywhere, you know what I mean? You'd get from the hood to the suburbs. And if you're not hitting them, boy, you start hearing this bomb sound. <laughs> but that, and it, it, in the, not even on your punchline, just in the beginning of your next idea. And if that punchline don't hit, which it don't, because everybody waiting to hear the bomb. <laughs> That's crazy. I've, I've never heard of that, but that is terrific. That is creative. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully. Dream fearlessly. I don't want to brag, but I have, really have a high IQ. I'm a stable genius. I got a big brain, and I got the best words. <laughs> oh, my God, he's black me. So how did you get on SNL? How did that happen? I mean, I started comedy, like, at 23, because I was trying to rap before that. And then I, then I had the brilliant idea of leaving chasing rap to go to comedy. So I just, just chose to be broke until I'm 31. Jerry, I know you hate that word, okay? Because your mama's a racist and she used it in a completely different context. She does. <laughs> I was in these institutions learning how to, like, Second City, and I was just playing and going to these jams, learning improv and sketch writing because I didn't finish college. I just went to community college for a couple of years. The second year was just to sell weed to make my money back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell nobody in college. As in between us. Uh, as I was getting uh, up in the, I guess, ranks of the Second City and these institutions, and I was doing stand-up at the same time, and I was in New Orleans, actually, with Jay Farrell. I was opening for him, and I had just got the call. And I went home, and I auditioned, felt good about it. You know, I called Andy Sandberg, because I had that connection. I was like, yo, I got auditioning tips, and they were like, yo, don't look for the laughs. They ain't gonna laugh. So I went in there, just like, I'm gonna do me. And I went in there, I did my thing and they were laughing. So I was like, is this bad then? Are they, you know? <laughs> and then uh, I got on a plane to go back to LA to continue working on this other show. And I ended up not getting it that year. I sat down, bitter as hell. It, just as I had gotten over it and moved on from it, they called me the next year and they were like, you can just go straight to callbacks. You don't have to like do both the auditions. I was like, okay. I'll do it, but I, I was coming in with that swagger like, I don't care, I don't need this. So I went in and did my audition. I felt good because I was like, I don't need this. And then they called me, um, I was in Detroit doing shows and I had hung out real late and I got a call from a New York number and it was like, hey, we got Lauren Michaels on the phone for you. And I was like, I'm, I'm hung over. I'm <laughs> and then he asked me if I wanted to come to New York and I was like, uh, yeah, okay, I guess, I guess this would be dope. Yeah, it was tight. Like, I am very glad I got it, though. It was something I really wanted to do. I just asked you, who would you call? How much would you charge? How would you sell it? What's his number? And where you get those little plastic baggies you put the drugs in? What's it like? Is it enjoyable? Is it stressful? It has a boot camp feel to it. It's like, there's no job like it in Hollywood, man. It's always moving, it's fast paced. For Monday, you just kind of coming up with ideas, writing the table reads that Wednesday, they pick that stuff and then you produce the sketch. Uh, if you have a pre-tapes on Friday and that's gonna be all day, then you do the, your live sketch rehearsals once or twice on that Thursday and that Friday. And then once with all the like costuming on, while you're editing, if you're doing another pre-tape, and then you just get one shot at the dress rehearsal with that crowd to see if it works. You really think you got what it takes to take down Donald Trump? 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 by the popular vote. <laughs> the dude that got beef with Nancy Lee Pilowski's Trump. And then from there, they pick what's going on in the live show. And then even then, in live show, 
just sitting there like things could get cut during the live show. So we all vying for these like few spots in this 90 minute show where we're all just trying to showcase our voices and it has like that audition feel to it, even though you already have the job, which is kind of wild, but also like it just causes you to write better and just be better. And I would say that like as good as some of the best shows feel, people will never understand how funny my castmates are. Like the table reads, it just the things I've seen them do. Like Keenan is do can't miss. Every time I bring up emotional conflict, he want to talk about the Lambo. Lambo. <laughs> Back then, it's maybe one of the funniest people I've seen at the table, period. Like Kyle, hilarious. I could name the whole cast. Like they just kill it. You just see so much creativeness, man. And with the writers and what they bring, it's nutty. And you can't control all the choices. Uh, of everything, but it's that rush, it's that adrenaline. It's like the Super Bowl for sketch comedy. Let's take a look at our final Jeopardy category, Lives That Matter. <laughs> I know, I got a lot to say about this. And... Yeah, I'm sure you do. When we come back... Did the last year, did everything that happened with Black Lives Matter change the dynamic of the show, how you guys worked, what uh, sketches got chosen, etc., or not really? This is the most diverse cast that has ever been on the show between the cast members and behind the scenes. So I think that alone has forced the institution to change. When you have that many people representing different backgrounds, you just have to force the change. Otherwise, you're just muting voices. And I think that show being a show that skewers everything and is on top of everything that's going on to like not address those things is kind of wild. Like we're still a sketch show. I still want to get silly and funny with it. Sounds like we all agree there's no way Derek Chauvin walks away from this. Well, I ain't gonna say all that. But you gotta know the stuff is out there and you gotta talk about it. To ignore it is just wild. I wouldn't be for it. I, just, I would just keep pitching Black Lives Matter stuff until it matters. <laughs> <laughs> How are you liking the uh, sitcom with Keenan? How's that going? I love this hat. It always reminded me of something Jaden Smith would eventually wear. I'm an I can't live it. I love it, man. We are a, a little family, for real. Like, I love writing for Keenan. I love working with Keenan. I love, you know what I'm saying, all, all of that. You know, it, it, it just made it easy. And uh, Keenan brings such a dope presence as far as being cool, accomplished, very good at the job, but also just a level of humility that you just don't see in a lot of people who've been doing it as long as he's been doing it. And I love having a fun set. You know, you might get roasted. One of the things I'm always asking people on the show is what they've learned about dreaming fearlessly. Because you know the number of people who've wanted something different for themselves. And for whatever combination of reasons, it hasn't worked right. What do you tell people when they come up to you and they ask you about dreaming fearlessly or in whatever way they ask you the question? All I've done is dream chase my entire life. I've had a bunch of jobs to support these dreams and like there's nothing anyone could tell me. Not in the sense of like I don't listen to anybody or I don't take any critiques, but, they, but when it came to what I was supposed to bring to the world, I was not gonna take no for an answer. Uh, or not be swayed by somebody because the dream is limited. You can't teach everybody vision, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes you just have it, you don't. You know, it's about how bad you want it because you're gonna make something happen. And it may not look like the thing you set out to do. You know, I set out to be a rapper, you know. Now rap became a part of a tool belt that I use for other things. And that is something I would have never seen 10 years ago. You know what I mean? The work ethic that you put into it and how you work is, is this the most important and follow through and sticking with it even when it gets tough. I want to do a little rapid fire with you, but I understand we're going to make it rapid impressions. Yeah, and I'm not an impressionist, but I do my impressions and I'm going to do my thing. If you could have dinner with anybody, who would you want to have dinner with? Uh, you know what, Carlos? I'll say that I, I would have dinner with uh, you and a couple of ladies from your uh, team. You know? I think they love you. I think they love me. Uh, and I don't think they love America. Hey, now have you done Obama in front of Obama? Not yet. Oh, that's gonna be great. I've been sitting with this Obama forever and I just never thought to use it. And then and, until one of my writing partners was like, hey, I wanna do like an Obama Springsteen thing. I'm like, oh yeah, oh, I can do Obama. Verse. Uh, best sold in the world, go. Sprite. 
Sprite? Come on, man, you can't be serious. I like Sprite, sorry, man. <laughs> All right, who's your second best impression? Who do you love to do? Which actor or movie star do you like to do? Listen, man, uh, I'm gonna have to tell you something, partner. Uh, if I acquire conflict, I'm gonna need that to uh, be uh, rectified expeditiously. You understand? Wait, I, that's that's not Cedric the Entertainer. Who was that? Oh man, you said Cedric? I was trying to T.I. Is that Cedric? <laughs> <laughs> and you know I love him too. Okay, that's good. I should have known that. All right, now give me an athlete. I don't know if I know athlete, but I, this what I could do is Stephen A. Smith. All right, you you, you think that Michael Jordan? Is anything worse than you think that LeBron? Can you give me joy? Are you serious? My neck hurts. You're ridiculous. Absolutely. I love him. All right, give me one of your favorites, whoever your favorite is. I love playing my dad. Nah, nah, listen, boy. Here's the thing that you need to understand. I'm the dad, okay? So while you ask me for basketball boots, I ain't gonna give it to you. Has he come to New York to get to see you live yet? Yeah, yeah, man. Cause see, they ain't believe in my dreams at first. They were like, rapper? That is not why I came up here from Mississippi. I, see, see, you can rap. Like my mom was the one that was like, another dream? Damn. <laughs> hey, Chris, I really enjoyed you and uh, and I'm rooting you on from afar and uh, just wishing you good things. Man, I appreciate you having me on the show. I appreciate you having a show that feels fun and like casual and and just uh yeah you're dope man yo let's hang let's hang out I'm double vaxxed, bro so you know leave out the microchips you know <laughs> we'll grab drinks outside or something man Monica you ready today? I thought he was so funny beautiful smile and he knows it too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he kept me laughing the whole damn time, yeah, so. Yeah. Where is Kimmy? I love how candidly and easily he admitted that he just watches a ton of porn. <laughs> you know, like to me, that was like an awesome insight and very honest yeah. about like what most dudes I think do with their time. Yeah. I kind of want to follow up with him. Like, okay. let's just talk porn. <laughs> <laughs> so. Eli, you ready to get I'm in there? so ready to get oh, in there. Oh, oh. The one thing I do not want to talk about with Chris Red is porn. I don't want to hear anything. We got the one joke. That's it. That's all we need. I definitely put him in my top 10. Absolutely. Wow. Yes. Yes. Wow. Absolutely. OK. You know I love when it cracks the top 10. Uh, I was trying to quietly laugh to myself the entire time. Just the absolute best. Marco, do you want to slide in? Damn. He's dope. <laughs> You've asked several times who should play you from SNL. Yeah. Come on. Oh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I hope you enjoyed Chris Red. Uh, I've loved his comedy, but you know, spending time with him, I feel more convinced he's gonna be a big time star. Feels like one of these Kevin Hart moments is about to come where all of a sudden you see him everywhere. I love him, I'm rooting for him. Appreciate his parents as well. Good luck to him. All right, listen, before we go, I wanna invite you to pick up a pair of my new favorite shoes. You've been hearing me talk about these shoes from Kariuma. They're fantastic. In fact, the kids wear a pair right now. Do yourself a favor, visit kariuma.com slash Carlos. Check them out if you love them. Hit me up on social media. Tell me which pair you bought. And if you're enjoying the show, remember, you can subscribe. There are more episodes. You can also watch the podcast and share the good word with other people. I'll see you soon.